Traditional intonation. Is there really such a thing, or is it just an excuse for poor playing? I'm going to look at the notes in the cracks across several traditions, Irish, Old Time and Scandinavian, and see what it's all about. Either it's in tune or it isn't. As a fiddle player, one of your biggest challenges, especially when starting out, is simply to get the thing in tune. But how to define in tune? Well, if you play C, for example, you're going to expect it to be exactly the same as the C on a piano or on an electronic tuner. So what are you to make of the idea that there are certain deliberate and correct notes which lie somewhere in the cracks of the piano keyboard and that do not coincide with the normal 12-note scale at all? For many years, I've been vaguely aware that there was such a thing as a tempered scale, which had something to do with bark, but it was not until I heard someone play an exquisite in-between note in a Norwegian fiddle tune that I realised that there was more to this than just a bit of dry theory. The note in question was to me like discovering a new colour of the rainbow, and I was determined finally to try and understand what was going on. First of all, we need to know how we came to have our conventional scale. The ancient Greeks were fascinated by the relationship between science, music and the gods. The mathematician Pythagoras discovered that if you pluck a string it will give a note that varies with the length of the string. If you exactly half the length of the string, the note produced will be exactly an octave higher. Shorten the string by a third and the note produced will be a fifth higher in the musical scale. So an A string, when shortened by a third, will produce an E note. Fifths and octaves occur in all musical systems. Their simple mathematic relationship to nature led the Greeks to an obvious conclusion to which many still subscribe today that music is a gift given to us by the gods. Unfortunately, when God, on the eighth day, created music, he screwed up rather badly. If you start on a C and keep on reducing the string length by a third, you proceed round what we now call the cycle of fifths, C, G, D, A, E, B, F sharp. Or if we go the other way, increasing the string length by a third, the notes descend C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat. And G-flat is the same as F-sharp, right? That's where it all goes wrong. The notes created by Pythagorean tuning, in other words, by the laws of nature, do not match up and create that beautiful cycle of fifths. G-flat is not the same as F-sharp. An A note, raised by a series of perfect fifths, will never produce another A. So what was God thinking of? Maybe he was humming something modal at the time. Maybe Swing Low Sweet Chariot. Certainly not Eroica. He had fiddles and bagpipes in mind, not piano keyboards or symphony orchestras. Maybe it was a little test. If humans think they're so smart, perhaps I'll let them solve this one for themselves. So what does this mean for music? A scale produced from Pythagorean intervals will produce melodies which sound perfect to the human ear, because they are. What they are not good for is either harmonising together in anything other than perfect fifths, or their inversion perfect fourths, or in allowing for key changes or modulations. As long as you stick to simple modal music with no harmony or chordal accompaniment, Pythagorean tuning is simply the best. But once classical music had developed to the stage where it wanted to use harmonies such as major or minor thirds, or a series of different keys, terrible dissonance was created. The solution was simple but radical. A new scale was created by dividing the octave into 12 mathematically evenly spaced notes. In the resulting tempered scale, every note was now slightly out of tune, but because the errors were spread evenly across the scale, the difference was not easy to spot, and most importantly, you could now play thirds which sounded acceptable, and the cycle of fifths would join up, allowing G-flat to sound exactly the same as F-sharp. With the keyboard tuned in this way, it was now possible, as demonstrated by Bach in his series of 48 pieces, the well-tempered clavier, to move through every key without producing serious dissonance. So where does this leave the poor, long-suffering fiddle player, who thought he was doing well when he learned to play his fiddle sufficiently in tune that the cat didn't leave the room as soon as he started practising. The first thing you need to know is that the idea of being in tune is not nearly as straightforward as you thought. All modern keyboards are tuned to the tempered scale, as are electronic tuners. So if you tune each of your strings to either of these, you will find that although your instrument sounds okay against the keyboard, your fiddle will not be perfectly in tune with itself. The open strings will not be the perfect fifth apart that you might hope for. If you're going to be playing with a keyboard or guitar, you better be in tune with them. If you're playing solo or just with other fiddlers, you're better off tuning your fifth to one another rather than to a tuner or keyboard. Not only will the fiddle sound sweeter, the open strings will also vibrate better in sympathy with the fingered notes. 
For example, if you play a finger G on the E string, in tempered tuning, this will not be perfectly in tune with your open G string. To make the finger note speak to the open string, you need to be using Pythagorean tuning. Let's now look at a few individual fiddle traditions and see how they deal with tuning issues. Firstly, tuning in Irish fiddle music. The suggestion that there is such a thing as Irish tuning has been around for a long time. In the introduction to the Roach collection of Irish traditional music in 1909, Cahir Ubrainon stated, It will always be impossible to give a perfect rendering of our old melodies except with the old intonation. According to the tune collector Brendon Brannock, in Irish music, C and F are somewhat sharper than the corresponding notes on the piano. It's said that directly halfway between B and D on that instrument lies the C of traditional music. Not everyone agreed with this analysis. In 1908, the Irish composer and arranger Arthur Warren Darley, displaying a typically arrogant classical player's view of traditional music, gave a speech in which he debunked the whole notion. Here's a sample of what he said. Because a singer or player, through lack of technical means, sang or played with a total disregard to any correctness of intonation, that did not qualify them to claim that they were using a scale of unusual construction. Their ear being totally untrained, they involuntarily produced a music not in any one scale, but in an infinity of scales of impossible construction. Fundamental misunderstanding of traditional intonation continued well into the 20th century. In the 1940s, the assistant director of music at Irish Radio was Dr Arthur Duff. Apparently it was very common for him to swiftly terminate a recording session with traditional musicians with a perfunctory judgement, out of tune, out of tune, out, out. So does the playing of traditional Irish musicians amount to using the Pythagorean scale? Almost certainly not. For one thing, it has been suggested that just as different parts of Ireland have different playing styles and repertoires, so there were once different accepted ranges of intonation. The West Clare style, for example, is said to include rather flattened major thirds. Rather, the pitch of particular notes was used as a form of expression, almost like an ornament. Another reason to think that Irish intonation is not the same as Pythagorean is that some players will use not eight different notes within a tune, but as many as sixteen, using a selection of thirds and sevenths which are lowered, neutral or raised, depending on the phrase. There are certain tunes where different versions have either an F or an F-sharp, a C or a C-sharp. Nowadays, most players will opt for one or the other, where formerly a fiddle player may well have chosen an area somewhere in between. The players most associated with the use of traditional intonation are people like Paddy Canny, Paddy Farhey, Paddy Cronin, James Byrne, Lucy Farr, Johnny Doherty, Bobby Casey, Julia Clifford and Dennis Murphy. This older generation were operating in a world which was not dominated by pitch-perfect studio-produced music and in a musical setting where keyboards and guitars were rare as accompaniment. Even with chordal accompaniment, the old intonation can work. The Clare fiddler Paddy Canny, on his self-titled album, demonstrates some extremely fluid intonation despite being accompanied on all tracks by guitar or piano. The effect, if anything, heightens the beauty and strangeness of his style rather than destroying it. And it's not only the older players who use traditional tuning. Kevin Burke has recorded many tunes with neutral notes. The King of the Fairies from the album Sweeney's Dream has a neutral C, as does Murphy's Hornpipe. Listen to the neutral sevenths here. Quivine O'Reillyg, a young and very innovative player, also makes neutral notes a feature of his playing. In American old-time fiddling, neutral notes are very common. In their detailed and comprehensive Ozarks fiddle music collection, Drew Byswenger and Gordon McCann found that 64% of the tunes they transcribed from old fiddle players had raised or lowered notes. Most commonly the fourth is raised and the seventh lowered. The effect is most striking in the pentatonic tunes, many of which are modally ambiguous, seeming to want to be both minor and major at the same time. Cluck Old Hen will be a good example. I spoke to all-time multi-instrumentalist and champion of microtonal intonation, Jody Staker, about its place in his music. He said that fiddlers place their fingers to be in tune with the old vocal music. Why? To sound good. They are playing in a way that is aligned with how our brains are built. Tempering systems are a recent thing and were designed for music that modulates between keys and whose structure is primarily based on harmony. Nowadays most recording studios use digital pitch correction which makes everything sound like elevator music. 
he went on to explain that the use of microtonal intonation was an essential ingredient when trying to get an authentic sound for any particular folk music. Playing old-time music without microtonality is like doing Greek cooking without olive oil or Mexican cooking without chili pepper. They each have their own characteristic taste and it's the same with microtones. Each interval has its own flavour. People who understand why not to put garlic in a sticky toffee pudding should not be overly challenged by the concept of leaving out minor thirds in cluck old hen. Scandinavian fiddling is where you will hear perhaps the purest and most deliberate non-tempered notes. Part of the reason for this is the extensive use of open string drones and also in Norway of the hardanger fiddle which has five sympathetic strings which ring on their own in sympathy with the fingered strings. The subject was studied in detail by fiddler, composer and musicologist Elvin Groven, who in 1927 published a thesis, Natua Skalen, The Natural Scale. He traced the origins of this scale in Norwegian music to the use of the selleflotte, or willow flute, an instrument without fingering holes, where the notes are produced from natural harmonics. He went so far as to design a pipe organ which used the same non-tempered tuning, its name mysteriously translates as reindeer voted organ. The Hardanger fiddle has always traditionally been played solo and so has escaped the influence of equal temperament which is found in some of the more modern repertoire of Norwegian fiddling. The five sympathetic strings which run beneath the fingerboard are tuned to B, G sharp, F sharp, E, C sharp or D. These would not ring on their own if the upper fingered strings were played in a tempered scale. As we saw in Ireland, there is a tendency to bend the altered notes in the direction of the phrase, so a C leading up to a D would be played higher, and a C leading down to a B would be lower. The whole approach to intonation is more deliberate and precise than in Irish or old-time fiddling, and there is more of a sense of using a completely different scale, rather than just modifying occasional notes in a standard scale. Here's Scottish and Scandinavian player Sarah Jane Summers. A Norwegian friend of mine once described the hardanger fiddle tuned in the untempered scale as sounding like butter. It's soft and gentle on the ear and soul, not abrasive or overly bright. In conclusion, it is clear that there is far more to traditional intonation than just uneducated, sloppy playing. Francis Roach, in 1927, summed it up beautifully in the introduction to the third edition of his tune collection. These notes between the tempered scale, these are like rare, rough gems, beautiful, sensual, emotional. They draw you in, and sometimes the tempered scale just feels clumsy and ill-defined. I love how the voice will find natural harmonies and avoid the tempered scale, unless forced to follow that straitjacket by a more dominant and tyrannical instrument like a piano or full-bore accordion. Sometimes it makes sense when forced by such behemoths of the musical world to quietly slip out and distract oneself by other means, rather than being swallowed up by the abuse of power such things and their button-pushing owners can wield. The low notes are the sound of the sea wind, and the high notes are the cry of the banshee that it carries. Either one alone is just a sound. Both of them together is an Irish sound. <laughs>